Okay, so let's start. I think we'll uh, have a few slides at the beginning, so even if people are a little bit late, they will uh, be on time for the, for the workshop. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Denis Janot. I am uh, director of the solution engineering team in uh, EMEA at solo.io. Um, I'm going to present the workshop with uh, Christian. You want to introduce yourself? Yes, hello everyone. My name is Christian Fakete. I'm working in Denis' team in the European field engineering team. And yeah, we were doing this uh, workshop together. Uh, uh, and uh, Lynn is uh, apologizing. She is not able to join, but she worked uh, with us uh, to prepare the workshop. So I want to say thank you to, to her. Um, what we are going to do, uh, as, we, as I said, uh, for the people who are already there, we are going to go through a few slides to introduce uh, the main eBPF concepts. And um, then we are going to use Instruct uh, platform for doing the workshop. So you will all have access to this uh, workshop. We are going to share again the link in uh, in a few minutes. Perhaps we can do it. Perhaps you can do it now if while I speak. Yeah. Um, and uh, please don't click on start because if you click on start, it's going to provision everything. And then if you don't use it for some time, it times out. And you know, when uh, when we are going to be ready to start, then it will be. Uh, you will have to do it again, so uh, the start should be quite quick anyway. Uh, as I was mentioning, for people who were not there at that time, uh, we give you many options. You can either just watch us doing it, or you can do it at the same time we do it, or you can use the same, this link until Sunday evening if you want to do it later, right? So it's, uh, it's quite flexible. Um, so I think we can just uh, get started. and. Uh, also, we want to try to make it interactive. We have 90 minutes, which is quite a good amount of time to be able to take our time. And if you have any question, uh, you, you can just uh, you know, do, go through these microphones that there is one here. And I think there may be one, one there as well. So if you have any question, really feel free uh, to uh, raise your hand and go to these uh, microphones. We'll try to make some breaks at some point just to give you time to ask questions, like perhaps at the end of the slides, for example. Uh, but yeah, we, we, we will try to make it interactive, even if it's complicated with so many people in the room. Uh, but yeah, we, we really want to try to answer any question you, you may have. So Christian, the floor is yours. All right. <clears throat> so as Danny mentioned, we have a few introductory slides at the very beginning, just to give you some high level overview of what eBPF is, what you can do with that, what are the various use cases, and uh, just to understand the technical detail, uh, the technical implementation. And after that, we will be using a open source uh, project to make it easier for you, because eBPF can be still a bit scary to, to some people. So uh, does everyone know what eBPF is from the audience? Can I see some? Hence, maybe, if you know what eBPF is. Ah, OK, so maybe it will be an intro session. So it's like a beginner level. Um, but it will be still a quite interesting way of um, developing, troubleshooting, and deploying uh, eBPF programs. So what eBPF is? Most of you already know what eBPF is, uh, based on the, the hands that I could see. But uh, eBPF is basically a a uh, flexible way to inject some custom logic into the kernel. There are various use cases why this might be a good idea. And the previous approaches were not the greatest to extend the capabilities of the kernel. Because one of the, one of the use cases for eBPF is um, observability, which is nice. You can do some custom things in the kernel, but if you are before eBPF, it was pretty hard to add that custom logic, rebuild your kernel, um, use kernel modules, for example, and it was not something that, would, uh, that you could do easily in production. Your security and the other um, platform teams uh, before eBPF were probably not happy about adding a custom kernel modules to, to the production machines because anything could happen. So eBPF is, is here to help. As I mentioned, you can write little performant um, programs that you can just ingest in the kernel and uh, uh, leverage 
that logic that you injected. Um, it's also a safe way to inject some custom logic into the kernel because there's a verifier. So there's a process that needs to be. The first step is to uh, run the logic through the verifier. And if the verifier thinks that this code might break your kernel, it won't load it, which is a quite nice thing to do because otherwise your production machine uh, might just die on the spot. And it's also quite performant. Uh, and eBPF is using BPF as the underlying technology. Originally, that's the same technology that was used for, for TCP dump, for example. But eBPF is a, let's say, more modern way to, to do similar things. As I mentioned, there are various use cases. You can see the four main categories here. Security, why security is important. If you have, if you have a way to observe what's happening in the kernel, the security team uh, would be really happy to have, that capab to have those capabilities and uh, be able to do some additional auditing on top of the previous uh, methods that were available to them. You can also do some tracing, profiling. You can extract some information while the application is running. You can uh, correlate that information with other data that is being extracted from the kernel itself. There are networking use cases. For example, uh, Cilium is using eBPF to some extent to uh, solve some networking challenges. And as I mentioned, there's the observability category, which is also quite interesting because you can uh, you can easily extract these informations with the help of eBPF. During this workshop, we will be mostly focusing on the observability uh, use case. If someone is not fully uh, if, if someone doesn't have the full picture how IBPF can work, then I think this is the best picture uh, that you can use to understand what's happening and what are the actual components if we are talking about an actual IBPF program. As you can see, there's a user program on the left, and there's a kernel side of the things on the right. You need both because you need to have a way to inject that logic into the kernel. The kernel part on the right is the Actually, eBPF uh, part, that's the more exciting one because that's where, that's where the eBPF magic happens. <clears throat> that's the place where you can uh, specify your custom logic that you want to inject in the kernel. The user program, the user, uh, user space part is more like a thing that you have to do to be able to visualize the information, for example, that is coming out of the kernel, but it's, it's not that exciting. You have to... Uh, write the code to, to visualize what's happening. You have to handle user input. That's like something that you have to do, but it's not that important. Uh, and this is why uh, this talk is uh, quite exciting, because after the talk, you will have a quite nice and easy way to focus on the kernel space part. That is the more exciting one, as I mentioned. And we were basically using Prometheus to take care of the user program part, if you wish. So let's talk a bit about what's happening here. So you need to load that custom um, code into the kernel somehow. This is that you are managing from the user space program. After that, the kernel uh, tries to verify the actual program that you have, and if it's verified and there's no issue with that, then uh, you can, we can move on to the actual uh, BPF part. That BPF uh, rectangle in the middle is basically the custom logic that you are injecting. eBPF itself is event-based. That means that you need to uh, take a look at what kind of options you have in the kernel. Uh, these can be K probes, kernel probes, U probes, trace points. These are various uh, points in the kernel itself. And when uh, the kernel reaches these probes, then it will execute the custom logic that you want to inject. So this is why I said it's like an event-driven uh, approach or architecture. After that, after your custom logic uh, was execute, execute, uh, executed, the output that that logic uh, um, extracted from the kernel itself uh, will be put into maps. And those maps are like the way to grab, grab that data from the kernel side 
and uh, surface that on the, on the user space side. You put all these events and data that you extracted from the kernel itself into the map, and you are basically just reading from that map from user space. After that, the data is visualized. Um, and Bumblebee is the, uh, the actual project that we will be using uh, throughout the workshop. But before that, we will also show you the traditional, original way of interacting with uh, eBPF programs. These are the programs that were um, mostly mainly created by, by Brandon Gregg while he was at uh, still Netflix. Um, these are the de facto standard uh, eBPF programs that most of the observability-related um, eBPF tools are using behind the scenes. And what we will be doing is that we are taking a look at the existing ecosystem that is in that upstream uh, GitHub repository, and we will be using Bumblebee to package it as a OCI image. It's like a, a Docker image, if you wish. Uh, you could push that into local or remote repositories. So it's a quite nice and cloud-native way to, to consume these little eBPF programs. And as I mentioned, you don't even need to think about the actual user space uh, responsibilities and these tasks, because you can, with Bumblebee, you can uh, auto-generate Prometheus metrics from these kernel events, which is quite nice, because in cloud-native uh, infrastructure, you are most probably already running Prometheus. So I think that was the intro that we have. Um, this is the link that you can use to access the Instruct platform that we will be using. And for the first part, I will hand it over to, to Danny. Yeah, I will wait a few seconds so that you can load the environment if needed. So yeah, if you now can uh, all go to this uh, link, and uh, I'll just keep it you know, a few more seconds, and I'm going to switch to the uh, Instruct uh, interface, but now you can click on the on the play button to start the workshop. So what is going to happen behind the scene uh, is going to provision uh, a virtual machine for each of you. And uh, in this virtual machine, we are going to uh, play with eBPF, and we are going to deploy Kubernetes cluster, build a very simple observability tool from scratch to visualize the traffic in your Kubernetes cluster. So you have like a practical example. And then uh, Christian is also going to go through some more advanced uh, use cases, uh, showing you that you can use eBPF for networking use cases, but also for you know, tracking file open or whatever you want to, to intercept uh, in your kernel. So I'm going to now uh, exit this and go to the Instruct Lab here. And uh, after you click on the Start button, it should take um, like two minutes, perhaps, not more, because it's just like a provisioning of a VM. Uh, obviously, we are a lot of people, but you know, Instruct is quite robust. We already did like a workshop for uh, 500 people or more, so that should be fine. But who knows, right? Like when, <laughs> when we try to do like 500 provisioning in parallel, uh, it can be a little bit challenging. So I'm just uh, going to wait for a minute. Uh, in one minute, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you have everything ready. So we have an idea, but you know, if everything seems to work well, and then we are going to to get started. Can you see the screen properly, by the way? Or should we try to make it a bit uh, bigger? Looks good. Especially on the left side, it can be perhaps a little bit small, right? Yeah, let me try to make it bigger. There's some text on the right, but that's more like for you when you are doing it on your own. If you are in the room and uh, listening to us, then you don't really need to read the whole thing. You can just uh, focus on the terminal on the left. So looks better? 
Cool. Thank you. So let's see where we are now. Like, can you all raise your hand if it's ready on your side? Ah, that looks quite good. So I think uh, we are probably ready to go. Perfect. So for people who are like, uh, everyone probably know in this room like this uh, Kelsey, uh, what he did when he did like this Kubernetes the hard way. So we are kind of trying to do the eBPF the hard way first. And then we are going to show you how to make it like a little bit simpler, right? And uh, we'll start with a little bit of history even. So um, when you, do, you, can, you can read this text later, but uh, it's basically a summary of uh, what Christian said before, right? So if you forgot about what Christian said and you want to do the lab again in the weekend, then you can read that paragraph and you know, get the same uh, explanation. What we are going to do here first is that we are going to show you how to do um, compile and load uh, eBPF program without Bumblebee, right? Uh, we are going to show you how people were doing that at the beginning with something that is called uh, BCC. And then uh, we're going to give you how people do it generally today with uh, libbpf. And we will show you how we can do it with, uh, with Bumblebee. So the first approach that uh, was available was like using uh, BCC, which um, was like uh, something that was uh, using Python. So it looked really a good idea because, oh, Python is like not too complicated to use and a lot of people are comfortable using it. Uh, the challenge is that um, if you remember what Christian explained, you have this user space program and you have the kernel program and basically the user space program contain the kernel program that it has to load. And uh, if you look at the, the, the uh, BCC program in Python, you will see that uh, you have basically uh, a string in the middle that represents the kernel program I want to load, which is in um, in C, right? So you have a Python program, but you have to put a string that represents your C program in the middle, and this is where you have the most important logic. So having the rest in Python was not helping so much, and it was also a little bit confusing to do this that way, right? To be able to check if the code is valid, and imagine if you want to use like VS Code and all these things, right? That's, that's not ideal. And the other problem is that um, when you were loading that um, program, you add some dependency in your kernel, especially you needed to have the Linux uh, kernel headers, which is definitely not something you want to have. Uh, that's not kind of the package you, you want to put in your production clusters, right? So that was quite a nice approach to experiment with it and to play with it, but definitely not to have like a, a portable binary that you can deploy anywhere, right? So we are going to just start with this, just to see how it looks like. So we have this program, and you see all the, the every time you have a command that uses this data directory, you can also go to the files here, and in the data directory you can see the, uh, we are using the BCC here. So it's a little bit nicer, you know, to, to see what the program is doing um, that way, right? But uh, if I just, show a little bit here, you see this C program here that is attaching to this uh, probe here for being executed every, every time there is this TCP uh, connect and uh, does different things. And then what we see here is that the logic of the Python program, which is that I want to load this uh, program that is the C string basically and then uh, I want to continuously read messages that are coming from this map. So you remember Christian spoke about this map that uh, is in the kernel that the user program can read from. In fact, in the use cases we are going to show, even the one you do at the end, Christian, you don't do any write to the map. It's just reading in the cases we do, right? Yes, in, in the observability use case, you most of the time just reading from that information because we are just inter interested in what can you get out of the kernel. Uh, what's happening with those events that you are uh, catching with your uh, custom logic. Um, writing into this is 
it's not something that is pretty common for the authority use case. Exactly, for this use case it's not common, but it's kind of a way also you can drive a change of behavior, right? You have your kernel program running, you can write something in the map from the user program so that the kernel logic reads what you have in the map and say, oh, the user program tells me that now I have to, 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 to do something different, you know? So it's also a way to, it's, it's, the, it's a two-way interaction if you want. Um, and then it just prints what it gets, basically. So it's, it's pretty basic. Um, so if I go here, uh, you have this, uh, generally speaking, you have this play button here, uh, something they have added after we build the workshop initially, so we've tried to put it uh, everywhere, but some of, some of the instructions you still need to copy and paste, but you will see most of the time you, you will just have a play button, it's a lot more convenient. Uh, so here, it's just doing everything I described, and every time there is like a network communication, this TCP connect is happening, it's just deploying the, the source and destination address. Okay, so pretty basic uh, example. So now, let's speak about the second uh, way. And uh, in the open source community, you, you know you generally have multiple projects that compete one versus another and so on. But what's quite interesting when you start to learn about eBPF and you start to look at, okay, BCC and libBPF and so on, is the first time I have seen that these two very, very different options, they are in the same repo, basically. <laughs> so in the same repository, you have the BCC original approach and the libBPF uh, approach. And then the libBPF approach is um, basically using uh, only C. So you have the user program in C and the kernel program in C. Um, and uh, the other difference is that it's uh, more portable. So you don't have like uh, this need of having these um, uh, kernel headers deployed uh, in, the, in the machine, in the kernel, uh, in the operating system, sorry. Um, so that makes it very portable, basically. You can uh, compile it and then you can just like uh, copy the binary in a, in a VM or in a server and then you can, you can start to to use it and to run it. And uh, you'll see also in Bumblebee that we, we've worked on this portability and making it like a little bit easier than just making a copy or SSH or this kind of things. So again, uh, you can go to this um, file tab here and you can see the different uh, files here and you can see two main ones, right? Uh, you have the one that's called bpf.c uh, that is basically um, your kernel program. And then you have the one that is called just C here, which is your user space program, right? So you see the user space program is really like, uh, I want to load my kernel program and I have some error handling if I cannot load it. And then as soon as it's loaded, I'll always execute this print uh, count function. And this function basically is again, reading the data from the map uh, in the kernel to display this information. Um, the kernel side of it, uh, what it does is uh, having this um, um, attachment to different probes, right? So it says that I want to attach uh, to this uh, TCP uh, v4 connect event. I want to attach this uh, enter TCP connect um, function and uh, you can see this function, which is a little bit here, and just like uh, you get some uh, information and some update about the map, this famous map that can read by the uh, user program, and you see here that we define these maps, right? So for example, here, in that specific case, we have this uh, map that is of a type uh, hash, and we are not going to go through all the details of this, but uh, in the text here, you will see more information about uh, the different options. You have this option that's called like a ring buffer and the other one that is like a, a hash map. Um, they, depending on your use case, you choose one or the other. And uh, here what we do is that we just say that we have this uh, key uh, on this map and a value and the value, is, the key, the value is just a, um, a number 
but the key is the struct, which is this struct here, right? So basically, what that means is that the key is going to contain my source and destination IP address, and my value is going to be a counter. And uh, if I um, go back here, and if I execute this command here, you see it's just a binary, right? Like I say, it's very portable. As soon as you have uh, compiled it, you can just copy this binary in another machine, and uh, you just run it. It's just one binary because this binary is the source program that is going to, it contains itself the kernel program that it needs to load, basically. So I run this. Oh, I am not in the right. Uh, no, oh, yeah, we, I think, I thought we compiled it, but we are going yeah, to do it now. Yeah, we missed a few steps. So we just copy the files. You see the play button. It's a lot better. And uh, then we do this make TCP connect. That's what is going to uh, compile uh, this program so that we get this uh, single binary. And after that, we'll be able to, to run it. Another difference between the traditional BCC and the libpf implementation is its performance. We won't be doing that now, but when you are doing the same lab at home, what you can do is that you, 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 you have two terminals here. So you can start the, the traditional BCC program at the same time when you start the, the TCP connect that we are building here. And if you compare the CP utilization between the two processes, you will see that the, the, the old one, the BCC one, will consume a uh, much higher CPU um, because it has to, uh, it's, it's like it's not a runtime uh, execution. It has to compile everything at once. And in, uh, especially when you, when you start the program, you will see an extremely high CPU usage. And that's another reason why the, the libpf based tooling is, is better, because on a production server, you most probably don't want to compile something that will consume that, man, that much uh, CPU usage, because you have actual business applications running there. Yeah, yeah, thanks. It's uh, really interesting to add, uh, add that, right? So, again, like why nobody's using libbp, uh, BCC in, uh, in production. Um, so, you see, the output is what we expect. Uh, the only difference from uh, the other program we had before is that here you see a counter, right? Instead of just displaying the uh, source and, and target all the time, right? We just uh, always indicate how many uh, occurrences we have uh, from. Uh, from that. Um, so that's basically uh, ending this uh, section, which is like uh, eBPF the hard way, which is not so hard, right? I mean, there are some technologies that are more difficult to <coughs> approach, right? What is very difficult, obviously, is writing this C code, right? It's like, uh, I would say, if I ask in the room, like, how many people can uh, write a program in Python? How many people now can write a program in C? A lot less, but still, I have to admit more than what I uh, generally see. So it's, uh, it's quite interesting. So we are going to do the same with uh, Bumblebee. And perhaps one thing I didn't show you really clearly is that also the program itself, you know, the, the C program that corresponds to the kernel in BCC and libbpf, has nothing to do. They are completely different syntax. It was not the same code, right? It, uh, the code from uh, BCC was using a completely different approach than the one from libpf. I think I can still see it here, right? So if I look at the BCC logic, this C program here, uh, you can see uh, the, the, the way the map is, is defined is completely different than the way it's, it's in uh, libpf, uh, all this logic here is completely different. It's using some other uh, libraries to do it compared to the way it works with uh, libpf, where you, you have these multi-lines for uh, describing the, the maps, and all the code is completely different. So the idea of Bumblebee is, is not to come with a third option. Right, is not to come with a third way to develop that, is really to simplify the way you do it with the BCC, uh, with the libbpf approach, basically. So we are not going to touch the code much. 
we are going to use some naming convention to slightly adjust the code that we have used before, but really slightly. But the idea is to really help you get started uh, very quickly without having to worry about any dependency, any uh, other tool to be able to compile the, the C code and being able also to help you to manage the life cycle of it. So you can deploy uh, Bumblebee that way. Oh, I have to go to the terminal here, it would be better. And that's an open source project we have launched some time ago and um, the goal was really to, again, like make it simpler to start uh, um, playing with eBPF and adopting it. But uh, our goal is really to have as many people as possible interested to make this project like uh, a, a living project with, uh, you know, many updates and so on, right? Right now it has been really just us and a few, a few other companies, um, but we will be happy to have a, a lot more contribution in the project. So when you do this B init, that's the first thing we do is that if you, if it's your really first eBPF program, instead of starting with like a, a blank page, you can just run this B in it command and it's going to ask you a few questions. Uh, like, uh, is it like for uh, the network use case or is it like a file system use case? If it's a network use case, uh, then uh, what type of map do you want to use, right? So as I say, you have this uh, ring buffer and uh, hash map and uh, we, I don't know, do you want to speak about like the difference quickly? Uh, yeah, I think we can, we can do that at a later stage because in the last lab, I will have, I will go through an actual example of what kind of changes you have to make to take an existing code and port that into Bumblebee. And I think that's, yeah, that's, okay. that's a better way to, to uh, Perfect, yeah, I don't want to differences. confuse people at that stage as well, so yeah. it's good. Let's make it good. easy. So here we choose a hash map, and then you can decide, uh, do you want to just like uh, print the value as they come, or do you want to have a type of counter or gauge? And you will see why as well, because we are going to show you some nice output that we can get from the program. And then you can decide how you want to call the program. So here we just like call it like prop.c. And uh, that's a fully functional program that looks like this here. And it doesn't do much, but the goal is just to allow you to get started, right? So that uh, you, you have like already uh, an example uh, to start with, right? So we are not going to compile this one. It doesn't really make so much sense. It's just to show you that we have this like uh, init command to get some skeleton uh, ready for you. Um, what we are going to do instead, we are going to uh, go back to this TCP connect example that was the program we have used in the, in the previous lab with libbpf. And we are going to do a small difference. You remember I said the goal of the project is not to give a third option. The goal of the, of the project is really to uh, make it simpler to use libbpf, if you wish, right? So what we want, we want, we don't want to modify the code. We want to do like the modification as small as possible. And the only thing we need to do in that case is uh, basically to add a naming convention to the map. So you see, if I do a diff between the program that we have used just before and the program we are going to use now, the only difference is that we have um, added here this dot counter ad, as a suffix of uh, the dot maps, and that's enough for Bumblebee to know that, oh, this map, I want it to act as a counter. And you will see that uh, we are going to emit some uh, metrics and these metrics will be emitted with the right type because of this uh, uh, additional information we have added. But the program, the, the everything else, stay uh, exactly the same. So if I copy this file here and I want to build it, the idea was really to take the Docker experience, right? Like uh, nothing is better than uh, this like Docker build, Docker run, you know, all these things like Docker push, right? That's why people love Docker, right? It's like this user experience. So the goal was kind of trying to do the same. So here we do not a Docker build, but we do a B build. And uh, the first thing that is nice with this uh, command is that you don't need any dependency in your machine. 
because it is going to get a Docker image behind the scene that has all the prerequisites to compile the program. So uh, the first time you do it, it takes like perhaps 30 seconds to compile the, the, the image. But the second time you do it, it's very quick because the Docker image that is used with all these dependencies to compile the, the code is already in your, in your laptop, right? So the second time you, you, you run this command, it takes like three seconds, perhaps, like four seconds. And uh, the other thing that is interesting is that we, when we build it, uh, we are um, generating an output which is uh, in, a, in a directory. I think it's even like a hidden directory. So you can, get the, you can get the binary if you want to just execute it. But what we do is also we uh, create it as an OCI image so that we can use the portability of the OCI images. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone knows what is an OCI image, but that's kind of the same format that is used by uh, Docker, right? So um, it, it's a way for us to, again, not only help uh, compiling, but also help distributing the program that has been built. So because I have this OCI image, now I can do a Docker push to uh, this uh, local uh, 5000. And if I do uh, look at my Docker engine here, I can see that this is a registry. And basically, this is just the standard open source Docker registry, right? Because I have, a doc because I have an OCI image, I can just push it to any OCI compliant uh, registry, basically. So I do have, I, I have built it, then I have pushed it. Now, obviously, I want to run it, right? So that's the last, uh, the last um, option that you generally use when you, you do something with Docker, right? So same idea. I do a B run, and I give the image name, right? And uh, you have a UI, kind of UI, uh, not a UI, but like, uh, you, you know what I mean, right? You have like a, an output that is a little bit nicer, that is not repeating itself and just like update the value instead of uh, always uh, uh, adding the new line again and again. But that's obviously the goal is not to launch a program and to watch this interface, right? I mean, some use cases, why not, right? You want to to create a debugging tool, you may be happy to see the output here, right? But uh, what we believe is uh, a lot more powerful when you load the program is to emit some metrics so that you can get this information here uh, provided as Prometheus metrics. So if I go to the second tab and I run this curl command, then you can see here that I have uh, at the beginning, I think, you see here I have this uh, um, metric, these metrics that basically show uh, the source address and destination address and the number of uh, occurrences, basically. So the same thing I see here, I get that as metrics. And because they are Prometheus metrics, then that can enable a lot of use cases, right? Because I can uh, scrap these metrics, store them in Prometheus, can build a graph and a dashboard on top of that, you know. So on, in the observability side, it opens a lot of uh, different use cases. So that's it for the overview of Bumblebee, and we are going to now uh, deploy a Kubernetes cluster and try to show you how we can use such a program to show you what are the different communication that are happening uh, in your cluster. Maybe before I do that, any question? Sounds good. Don't, f don't hesitate. If you have a question, raise your hand, and uh, we'll make a, a small uh, break in the presentation to, to try to answer it. Oh, that might be a question there. Yeah. You have a microphone just here. Yeah. Thank you, we always need the icebreaker, the first one who ask a question. Oh, we cannot hear you, can you? I'll do it better. We'll do it the old way.
Thank you. Uh, thank you so far uh, for uh, the workshop. Uh, I have a question like this generator, uh, it generates C-sharp code, uh, C, C code. So is it possible to have another generator for Golang, for instance, or is it only for like C when, when dealing with eBPF and uh, those stuff? Yeah, so it's, it's really just for C, but you see we've uh, built it when at the first uh, time when you do the B in it, it was asking you which language. So we did that in keeping in mind that there may be other options, but uh, Bumblebee is really just doing that with uh, C. But basically for eBPF programs, these are traditional, the actual kernel code that you are writing for eBPF programs is either C or Rust. Since Golang is more like a user space language, it's not performant and safe enough for, for the kernel. So that, 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 uh, that's the reason why it's, uh, most of the time it's uh, C or, uh, or Rust. But the Rust support would be nice if we have any Rust developers and you are interested in doing that, that uh, generator uh, to add that new feature, then uh, all the contributions are more than welcomed. Let's try. How many Rust developers we have in the room? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's weird. It's an eBPF talk, and we don't have a single Rust developer. No, we have one. We have one here. Ah, one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. I'm pretty sure that if we have the same question in uh, two years or three years, that will be a different uh, number. Okay, so here what we are going to do first is that we are going to deploy, uh, so we have a Kubernetes cluster, I forgot it, we, I think we already have it in fact, from the beginning. Uh, when you do, yeah, I don't remember where we deploy it, but anyway. Um, so you can just create uh, this uh, namespace and uh, what we are deploying here is like um, the book info application, so for people who are uh, playing sometime with Istio, um, you may be already aware of uh, this application. It's just like uh, an application that has multiple microservices because as I said, our goal is to be able to display which service talk to which service in the cluster. So we need to have a few interactions, right? So we just deploy this uh, program here and uh, we just wait for uh, all the pods to be running. That should be quite fast. It's already there, perfect. And then we are also going to uh, deploy Prometheus because you remember I said that we can emit some metrics. So what we want to do here is to uh, collect these metrics and store them in, in Prometheus. So we just like create this namespace and we uh, install uh, Prometheus. And then what we, we will do is that because we have an OCI image, it's very easy to deploy this program uh, in our Kubernetes cluster, right? So we are just uh, um, going to do that. But we are not going to deploy the OCI image I have built before. Instead, what we do is that we are deploying uh, a Docker image that contains the B uh, CLI, right? because what we want is a program that is able to load this, um, this program we have built in the kernel, right? So I know this part can be a little bit confusing, right? Because it's an OCI image we have built, but we can, it's not an OCI image that you can run on Docker, right? That's, a, that's an OCI image that is just like uh, the, the, the eBPF program that we have built, right? What we need to load in Kubernetes is a real Docker image that contains Bumblebee so that when it starts, it can load the, the, the program into uh, the kernel. So what you see here in the demo set is that we say, I want to use this uh, Bumblebee uh, Docker image that have the BCLI, and what are the arguments? The arguments are B run insecure because we are going to get it from the registry that is just like a plain HTTP one and we give the, uh, the, the, um, the name of this image that we have built before. In that case, it's not called uh, local host 5000 like before, it's called master because master is the host name of my um, VM and the Kubernetes cluster is running in this VM as well. 
So it knows how to get that uh, um, access to that registry, basically. So when we deploy this daemon set, what is going to happen is that in each uh, node of my uh, Kubernetes cluster, I will get, uh, basically, um, this uh, Bumblebee um, image deployed, and this image is going to load the program we have built before. So the same one we did before, right? No modification, we just like uh, run it that way. So if I do a care get pods, then we see uh, Bumblebee is running uh, in the default namespace, and before we deployed uh, the application in different namespaces here, right? But now we have, uh, and that's what I probably forgot to show you is that, I think we show it a little bit later, later but uh, we have like uh, multiple nodes, right? Because the idea is also to show you how we can use it to collect, um, because we have these uh, metrics that are emitted by the program, we are going to collect that, run the program in the different nodes of the cluster, and store that in the in a common Prometheus. So that's uh, now running. I now need to create this uh, pod monitor to collect the metrics from uh, the daemon set. If you are familiar with Prometheus, you have different ways to do that. You can use annotations or you can use like a pod monitor. So that just says that now uh, I want to collect all these uh, metrics and store them in Prometheus. And then you can just generate some traffic, basically. Just generate some traffic so that now uh, my application is used. So these communications are happening. So where, where are we so far? We have our eBPF program, that is really this basic program that has like source IP address, destination IP address, number of communications. We have this for each node. And you know that the pods have these pod IPs, right? And the services have this service IP. So what we have right now in Prometheus in reality is uh, we have like these uh, metrics that say pod IP talk to service IP, pod IP talk to service IP, pod IP talk to this service IP, which is quite nice already, but you, you may want something better, right? You may want to be able to know the pod name to the service name, right? Pod name to service name, it's, it's a lot better, right? So for that, we have a program that is just a demo program that's called KBPF. And what this program is going to do is, we are going to deploy it here. It's going to, and perhaps this one, I can make it bigger. So what it's going to do is going to um, go to Prometheus, run some queries, to get all this information. So it will have all this information that I have like source IP, uh, pod IP, service IP, pod IP, service IP. And what it does, it also use the API of the Kubernetes API server to know, oh, what is the pod name that corresponds to this pod IP? Or what is the service name that corresponds to this service IP, right? So that instead of displaying uh, IP addresses everywhere, we, we can display something that makes sense, right? And uh, it does this, and then it's basically just uh, display that in a UI so that you can see uh, what's going on. So I have deployed it here, and now, if everything goes well, we can go there, we can refresh it. And you can see here, right? You can see that uh, I have like uh, many communications happening. I have like the uh, product page service that is talking to the review service, uh, the, the, the pod that is talking to the review service, the review service correspond to these two pods, V2 and V3 here, they also call to another service that's called rating, right? But you also see that uh, the Prometheus uh, components are uh, talking to the Kubernetes API server, you see the um, the, and you don't see KABPF here, right? Because that's the first time I loaded it, right? I loaded it once, it got the data, but it doesn't exist in this picture because it was not yet in the metrics. But what's interesting is that if we try to reload here, we'll also start to see this uh, new component which is basically 
the KBPF program itself, right? Because now what we see is that we have this KBPF pro service that talk to, that correspond to the pod, and the pod talk to Prometheus and talk to the Kubernetes API server, like we've seen in the, in the picture before, right? So again, the goal is not to tell you, go and do that in production. The goal was really just to show you that finally with a, a very small uh, eBPF program and some correlation with um, what the Kubernetes API server can give us, uh, we are able to display some quite interesting information about what's going on in our Kubernetes cluster. So that's it for me, and uh, Christian is going to go through a few more examples and a little bit deeper. Thanks. And this demo was originally created quite some time ago now, but if someone is proficient with, uh, with Prometheus itself and, and the Grafana uh, ecosystem, you might also know that there's a service graph data source or, or parallel type for, uh, for Grafana itself. And you can get the very same information, like the, what's the actual uh, pod name under that pod IP. There are cu default Kubernetes metrics that you can get for free out of the box if you are running the Kubernetes stack. So if you do some advanced relabeling uh, purely in, uh, in, in Prometheus, you can uh, visualize all this inside Grafana. You don't necessarily need to build a, another pro uh, project for that. Um, and that's, that's also uh, quite nice. Do we have any questions? Yes, if I may. So thank you for this workshop so far. I would like to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on the life cycle of the kernel side of this EPPF program. So let's say that the user's, user space part is uh, terminated, would that also mean that uh, whatever we install into that uh, virtual machine sandbox into the kernel, that's also got evicted? And what happens uh, if I would like to remove this whole thing from my Kubernetes cluster? Is it enough to just remove the daemon set, or what are the actions I have to take? Yes, as you said, so if you remove the daemon set, uh, everything will be cleaned up. It's like you only have the interaction with the kernel through Bumblebee itself. That's what's loading the actual logic. If you don't have the pod in this Kubernetes use case as a daemon set, uh, everything will be uh, removed from the kernel itself, not just the user space, <coughs> Prometheus visualization layer, but, every <coughs> but everything, sorry. And, uh, and just to add to that, uh, when, so we built it in a way that is kind of, if you would run five programs, then you would run five times this B run command, right? We also had in mind to enhance that. It may be something we do in the future or not, but uh, the idea was also like potentially to have like a way to manage the life cycle of several programs through one B command, for example, you know, so you, you could enhance that. But basically when you, when you run a user, program, this program is loading the kernel program. If you uh, stop this user program, it stops the kernel program. Okay, so it is enforced by, I don't know, not because of some hooks or callbacks uh, that just executed when the user space program got killed, but essentially when the user space program terminates, that immediately terminates the kernel part. Okay. Yes, that's, that's the logic. <coughs> Sorry, <clears throat> something is wrong with my voice. So that's, that's something that's taken care by Bumblebee for you. That's like the actual Go user space code that is there as a proper run the, the primitive version. But behind the scene, it also cleans up the, uh, the, the kernel program that is loaded into the kernel. You don't even need to, to think about that because it will be just taken care of you. And as Danny mentioned, we also have a branch. So if you go to the GitHub repository, solo-io on GitHub, you will find the Bumblebee repository. There's a branch called operator or something like that. That's an experimental branch that is aiming to do the same thing uh, that, uh, that Danny uh, just mentioned. That's like having an operator like uh, user experience for Bumblebee. You just deploy 
in that case, when you are deploying the operator from that particular branch, you are not actually deploying the whole CNI itself. Uh, you are just deploying the loader. You have the loader, part of Bumblebee, running as a daemon set, and you can create, uh, let's say, I think it's called probe. Probe is the, is the CRD, and what the probe CRD is defining is the actual um, OCI image of the kernel program that you want to load into the kernel. So the user experience in that case is that you, create, you apply a probe, that's the actual CRD as I mentioned, and that will uh, instruct your Bumblebee daemon set, the loader that is running as a daemon set still, to load the actual pro pro uh, program that you are specifying in the, in the probe CRD, which is quite nice. So you can just deploy another probe uh, custom resource into the cluster, and the uh, daemon set will load the, the other uh, program as well. Do we have any more questions? It looks like at the moment, no. So let's go to the ne next lab. We didn't spend too much time to explain. Well, maybe we have a question? Yeah, we have a question. Okay, we can wait. We have 30 minutes left, and we have two small laps, so let's take the question. Can you, yeah, you can hear me. My question is about uh, these two uh, which you installed uh, lastly. I think it's key BPF? Key BPF, yes. Yeah, so it's uh, just used to visualize in a, a graph manner or what is the interconnection between the components, right? Yeah, that's just a visualization layer. Yeah, and uh, one more thing, is it, uh, you, I think it's an open source tool that you can use it uh, freely, maybe? Yeah, it's it's something that I built some time ago. Uh, I, I don't think I have published that in any repo because it's a very basic program, but you can ping me and I'm happy to give you the code. It's just that it was like a dirty experiment. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of sharing code that is not really nicely written. So I'm a little bit shy with this, but if you want the code, I give it to you, no problem. It's really basic. It's just like, you know, querying Prometheus, getting data, and for each entry, querying a Kubernetes API server to get the IP and, and nothing, nothing really fancy. Okay, thank you. But as I mentioned, the, the Prometheus node graph or service graph, um, actually that's a graph on a panel type, uh, that's, that, that might be a more production way to, to visualize all this. You just need to do some relabeling, which might, probably also won't be uh, perfect code. It will be a bit ugly, but uh, it's nicer to have all this information in, in Grafana because most probably you are already using Grafana as well. <coughs> Do we have more questions? Yeah, we have one more. Hello. I have a question uh, regarding the... Is there some statistic regarding the injected uh, C program into the kernel? For example, in terms of performance? Yeah, that's a good question. So the traditionally and generally, the BPF part is really uh, performant. Uh, most of the price in terms of resource use, usage is that you have to pay for the actual Go Bumblebee demo set itself. <coughs> um, so yeah, you can you can for example take a look at the the, the graph on dashboards, the, the the default one that you can get out of the box with the Kubernetes stack, and you can take a look at the resource consumption of the Bumblebee pods itself. Usually it's like maybe 100 megabytes. It's a daemon set. If you have a simple program loaded into the kernel, it, it won't be too much higher than that. But there's also, there are also ways to inject, uh, to compose multiple eBPF programs into a single larger eBPF program and load that into, into Bumblebee. And you can see that if you, even if you included multiple one, the resource usage, usage won't, be, won't be that much higher because <clears throat> the, the, as I mentioned, the, the kernel part is, is pretty performant. Obviously, we are in the kernel, you have access to lots of things, and it's very easy to 
uh, get to a state when you have coordinate problems on the matrix. So in that case, the actual matrix uh, will be the will be your biggest program in terms of resource uh, consumption. Okay, thank you. And also just to note that uh, <coughs> the size of a BPF program is limited, so you cannot really write a program that would be having a very complex logic. Also for that reason that the goal is not to impact, you know, the performance, right? But, but obviously, you know, uh, you have a lot of power with it, so you also have to be careful. And uh, I think right now, I have never seen a uh, use case of or usage of eBPF that is not provided by a vendor, right? So I have not seen really adoption of eBPF, like people do their own and all those things. It, it probably exists, it's just that I didn't see it yet, right? Um, but if you have this such a use case, then obviously in the company, you have to have a lot of mechanism in place to have proper testing and, you know, validate what, what is the impact of your program, not only on performance, but only on, it can drop packets, it can redirect things, it can do a lot of magical things that are very difficult to debug, right, so. But the easiest and uh, most flexible way is just really to write a small uh, purpose build. I don't know, maybe in this case, it will be like, it's not even 50 lines of code, and you can get this information out of the cluster, and you can visualize from the, from the kernel, and you can visualize that uh, as Prometheus metrics. So if you know what you are doing, it's, it's, with Bumblebee, it's very easy to, to write, develop, test, uh, and deploy it as an image. You can, uh, the verifier is still in the, in the loop, so you, you can actually crash your kernel with, with, a, with a code like that. It, Bumblebee won't even build the problem, uh, the, the program for you if there's, if it, if it wouldn't pass the, the verifier itself. Um, we haven't spent too much time on actually explaining what's happening here. So this lab is called um, Bumblebee from scratch. We use the template generator that created the, the template, the boilerplate for you to get started. But in this lab, I will be going through all the lines that we have here because we only have, I don't know, 40, 40, 40 something lines of code here. And after that, we, I also have another lab where I will be focusing on an even smaller use case just so that you can understand how the, the kernel space uh, code works. So as Danny mentioned, at the very top of the file, we have a few headers. VM Linux H, for example, and all the BPF helpers. I think we haven't mentioned this, but if you are using libbpf, then you can get access to these uh, BPF uh, helpers as well, and these can make your life really easy. For example, there are lots of helpers, little functions in this library that can get you, for example, the name of the, the processes that are running, or the process ID. If you are doing uh, eBPF with the, with the earliest uh, possible way, like with the traditional uh, original BCC tooling, you would need to do all that work for yourself to be able to uh, find what's the, what's the name of the, of the process that is running. Uh, if you are using libpf, you can just import this BPF helpers uh, header and it will be uh, so much easier. So after the headers, we have this struct. And that struct is basically uh, how you want to describe your events that you want to extract from the kernel. Here, <coughs> in this case, we are interested in the uh, process parent ID, thread ID, process ID. These are the informations that, are, that will describe what kind of proce processes are uh, affected by the events that we are tracking with our eBPF code. And as I mentioned, this last part here is the actual name of the process because process ID is nice, uh, but you most probably are more interested in seeing the actual name of the process. So you have a struct like this, and that will describe all of your kernel events. That's all the information that you need to know. We also haven't been focusing on explaining where the labels are coming from when you are consuming these uh, with Prometheus. But you can see that these actual uh, fields in the struct will be the labels. So this is the place where you have to make sure that you are not uh, introducing a coordinate issue uh, when you are exporting everything uh, to true Prometheus. 
After that, we have another struct, and this struct is basically the map. We were talking about the map previously. The map is basically the way to exchange information between uh, kernel space and user space. <coughs> As we mentioned, in the, <coughs> in the observability use case, we are mostly just reading from that. So you can see that the type of this map is ring, buff, ring buffer. Uh, if you are using libpf, the modern way of developing libpf programs, then uh, most of the time ring buffer is the, is the best and most performant choice. Um, it has lots of benefits over traditional uh, other map types, for example, the, the perf buffer. Bumblebee itself cannot even support, it doesn't even support perf buffer. This is why we are also pushing everyone to, to use ring buffers. It, it's more memory safe, it's, uh, it's easier to use, it has really nice APIs um, through these uh, helpers and libraries. And basically, if you are taking an existing example from the libpf tools uh, GitHub repository, most of the time, the only thing that you need to do if that actual existing example is using uh, pair buffer, you have to migrate that from pair buffer to ring buffer. The next uh, lab that I will be doing right after this, we'll be going through a migration procedure like that. Uh, it's, not that it's not that complex uh, as it may sound like. <coughs> so we specified uh, the type of the map. We specified how many entries we want to store. And then we specify that all the uh, entries that we want to store in the map will be using the type that we uh, specified here. So it's quite simple. Uh, this exit is the name of the map that we are using. And this is important because if you remember, but we will take a closer look at this uh, in a bit, when you are exporting or exposing the kernel events as primitives matrix, the actual suffix of the matrix will be coming from, from this value. So this is why it's important to give a meaningful name to your map so that if you are, for example, uh, composing multiple eBPF programs together, if you, only, if you always call uh, this, for example, events, which is something that in the upstream BCD repository uh, is the case most of the time, you won't be able to, to differentiate uh, the various maps that you are using across your different problems, programs. So this is why this was called exits, because with this 50 lines of code, we will be tracking the exit sys call in your system. After that, we have this uh, map section here. This is something that's coming from the, the upstream implementation. And in Bumblebee, we have this dot print uh, suffix. And what it does is that it, it will tell Bumblebee that, OK, you don't need to expose uh, all these kernels, all these events as uh, Prometheus metrics. I just want to print those out. If you have print here, then you can use the Bumblebee CLI tool to, to visualize those. Uh, if I would want to expose these as primitives metrics, all I have to do is to change this print to, to counter. After that, we have the actual uh, logic, uh, kernel logic that we are injecting in. And this is a very good example, this line, this function of the various helpers that are out there and you can use with libpf. So as I mentioned, you can just use this BPF get current PID uh, uh, thread group ID, and the output of this um, uh, function helper will be the actual process ID. Uh, it also includes the thread group ID, so you might need to do some very minor uh, bit operations to strip the data, to have this, the, the kind of data that you are interested in, like as I mentioned, this includes both of them, so you have to strip uh, 32 units so that you can get the actual uh, process ID part. But if you are using these, uh, it's so much easier than, uh, than, uh, than without these. After that, we are uh, initializing our events. Um, you can also use another, um, another helper function to get the actual running uh, task that is running on your kernel. Here we are, what we are doing in this section is that we are populating these fields that we specified up here. So these are the actual fields that we need to populate in our map, because in our map we are having events. And after that, this is where we are uh, populating the actual values. So it's quite simple. Um, we are using another helper to uh, load the actual uh, mm, tasks that we initialized above. 
and we can use another helper to get the actual name of the process. Again, this is something that you would need to do yourself if you are using uh, BCC uh, in a raw format. After that, we have uh, the ring buffer specific uh, part. As I mentioned, ring buffer, we are using uh, ring buffer because that's currently a requirement for you to move existing uh, tooling or, or tools into, into Bumblebee itself. We are just reserving the place, uh, the, some place in, in memory and uh, mm, copying the data into the ring buffer. And from the ring buffer, we can do something like BPF ring buff uh, submit that will uh, push all the contents of the uh, ring buff to the, to the map. And from the map, Bumblebee will just read it and expose it in a format that, was, that we specified. And that's it. Uh, after we have this code, what I can do is that I can uh, copy this here so that I can build it into an image. I will call this exit snoop. It's a simplified version of the upstream uh, exit snoop. There were some additional logic uh, that I removed to, to make it simpler. Then I can push it to the registry. By the way, we also have a option like, uh, like this, B list. And that will list all the various um, images, all the images that you previously built. All right. After that, I can do a B run. And just out of the box, we will have some exit syscalls uh, happening in the system. And these will be uh, visualized with Bumblebee on this format because I only specified uh, maps.print, so I'm not exposing these as metrics. All right. Then we reach the last part of the workshop. Do we have any questions in the meantime? In the last part, I will be talking a bit more about the migration between perf buffer and ring buffer. And the actual use case will be building a umkill exporter, because catching out of memory exceptions in a Kubernetes cluster can be challenging. Um, but if you have access to the kernel, you can actually take a look at the, uh, the kernel probes in the kernel that will be most certainly uh, passed in, uh, during execution when an out-of-memory event happens. Without this, there are some metrics, there are some other approaches to uh, get out-of-memory exceptions, but you might not be able to, to catch all of them. All right, so when you are doing this on your own, you can read here about what's happening in, a, in, a Loon, in the Linux kernel uh, when uh, we are talking about out-of-memory exceptions. There's a scoring system, and uh, basically based on, the co based on the scores that are assigned to each process in the, on, in the kernel, uh, the kernel will decide which program to kill when it's uh, running out of memory. If you are running on Kubernetes, um, and you have a Linux kernel behind the nodes, uh, you can use CPU uh, memory limits and um, memory request values to um, to affect the scores basically. But the underlying technology and and the scoring system is the same. You are still running uh, Linux kernels after all. So we can take a look at the code for umkill. I hope it's big enough. Um, that's, that's, that's all the code that is needed uh, to catch an out-of-memory exception. Again, it's very simple. There's a header included. Uh, I will talk about the header later. But basically, in this header, uh, traditionally, the eBPF um, developers put all the, uh, that, that was where they specified the struct that are describing the events that you want to, uh, that you want to expose in some way. Um, so that's what we have in the header. That's the struct for the actual events. As I mentioned, uh, usually these are called events in the upstream repository. So when you are moving this code to Bumblebee, it makes sense to use a different name, for example, umkills or out of memory exceptions or something like that. Uh, we have these dot maps. We don't have anything Bumblebee specific here. As I mentioned, it's using perf buffer. That's the old uh, map type that, uh, that Bumblebee doesn't support. That's the mock key size. And we are putting uh, 
uh, and we are specifying the size of, of for all the events. The actual logic is here. <coughs> so when an out of memory exception is happening in uh, in a Linux system, you will uh, get you will get this uh, kernel probe uh, executed. It's called umkill process, so you can see that based on the name, there's no real way of going around this and having an out of memory um, exception happening in your system without passing this probe. What we are doing here is that the same thing that we did before. We are getting, uh, we are using the very same helpers to get the actual process ID. We can, uh, we can even reach uh, the memory pages that the process was reading, so that you can get some sense about okay, how much memory uh, the actual process wanted to read into the memory uh, right, right before it died. Here we are populating the name, the com <coughs> of the uh, of the old process that is getting out of uh, uh, memory killed. And uh, we can also, this FPID is the other process that was running at the same time when our, our other process got uh, um killed. Why is this important? This, is, this can be important or interesting because most probably if you have another process running at the same time, that's the process that most likely killed your actual uh, other process. So we can get some additional information on what's happening in your, in your system when you're having a, a situation like this. Okay, as you can see, it's like, I don't know, 20 lines of code, it's not too much, it's not too complex. Uh, if you take a look at the user space code, it's, uh, it's a lot bigger. It has all the tedious stuff that we discussed, handling the life cycle of the, uh, of the kernel program, loading it into the verifier, handling user input and output as well, visualizing the data. Um, but traditionally, if you are creating and building both the user space and the kernel space programs for your eBPF use case. Um, as it's tedious as it is, you can still get access to some additional data. So for example, here you can, in the user space, you can just run a, you can read from the proc file system and you can check what was the CPU load at the time when the umkill happened, which is nice context. This is a good reason to write your own uh, user space programs as well, but checking the load average is something that you only need if you are working in a constraint uh, environment and you don't have access to other metrics because if you, if you are exposing this uh, information as Prometheus metrics, you already have access to, to the load average, the memory usage, and all the other information as well. All right, what I'm doing now is that I'm downloading the uh, original code, umkill.bpf.c. And we can take a look at how, that how is that different from what we have for Bumblebee. Uh, these are the differences. So as I mentioned, the header includes the description of the events that we are putting into the map. Uh, the two process ID, the one that is getting goom killed and the one that is running at the time of the uh, incident. The memory pages and uh, both uh, names of the of the processes uh, that are uh, that are we are talking about. This is what's in the umkill.header file. After that, we have the struct. In the original example, as I already mentioned, we have the pair buffer. On the right, we have the ring buffer. This is the new uh, structure that we want to use. We just specify the number of max max, uh, max entries that we want to have in this map and we make sure that all the events are described in the format that we specified above. Nothing really changed uh, up to this point. Um, oh yeah, of course we have this maps.counter here because we want to expose this as Prometheus metrics because we are building an umkiller uh, and an umkill exporter. Um, okay. After this, in the actual code section, uh, we are attaching this custom logic to the very same kernel problem that we had before. Uh, we just need to handle data a bit differently. What we are doing is that um, we are using the API provided by, by uh, ring buffer itself. It's coming from the BPF core read uh, dot header, and it's also leveraging the BPF headers here. We can leverage the reserve commit API. So what we are doing is that we are reserving the space for our events. And this is one of the benefits of, of ring buffer itself. If 
this operation here was successful. So if successfully could resolve the place uh, in memory for our event, that means that it will be able to inject that and surface that on the user space. So if this is successful, then we can just go ahead, populate all the data. As you can see, we are doing the very same things. We are just um, uh, populating it differently. But at the very end, if this was successful, all we need to do is to do is to call BPF ring buffer submit, and our event that was successfully reserved will be committed to the buffer. After that, we don't need to uh, think about that. Um, it will be Bumblebee will be able to generate Prometheus metrics from that. So let's build this into a. Yeah, we have five minutes. Let's build this into an image again. Push it to the registry. We can run it. This is like a good local test. If I would have a failure here, then it makes no sense to deploy into a Kubernetes cluster because it wouldn't be, wouldn't be working. Now let's deploy uh, Bumblebee itself as a daemon set. And if you are running this traditional CLI version of Bumblebee in the cluster, then you can see that you can disable the, uh, the UI, the, the console UI that I just showed you, which is nice because it's consuming less memory in this case. All right, I'm referencing the, uh, the umkill image that I just built, and I want to expose the metrics as well. So now I should have running uh, the Bumblebee pods with the new configuration. Let's deploy Prometheus itself. We will deploy a pod monitor so that we are scraping Bumblebee right after this one is finished. And after that, since we are in a Kubernetes cluster, uh, I will be deploying a pod that will get an out-of-memory exception. I'm using this particular image, AV solutions slash memleak. Uh, the owner and the creator of this image is uh, at the conference. Uh, he visited our booth recently. Yeah, the guy is sitting right uh, in, the, in the back. So if you need a very good and reliable um, image, Docker image that is leaking memory, you should talk to him because it's a, it's a great, uh, great Docker image. We will be taking a look at uh, how that would work. Now Prometheus is installed. You have the pod monitor. Yeah, I need the prod monitor. Now we are scraping Prometheus. If I go to Prometheus here, I should have the UI coming up. All right, if you go to status targets, we should see that uh, we are scraping it. It might not appear right away, so we have to wait a bit. You don't necessarily need to refresh it. Maybe I skipped something, I should. Unchanged. Three more minutes and the configuration doesn't seem to be working. Ah, okay, they are coming up. Good. We will have the data soon. So after this, let's deploy the memory leaker application from Arnold. It's already 1.0. And if we check the pods, kubectl get pods, we will see that the memory leakers in crash loopback. If you are watching this right after the crash loopback, you should see that it's getting um killed. It's an actual event or status in, uh, in Kubernetes itself. I might not be able to, yeah, um killed. Uh, if you go to the UI, I should have all the pods in a healthy state. All right, and you can search for the metrics, eBPF. Umkills, as you can see, the name is coming from the from the map. 
you can execute it and you can see some additional information. These are all the labels that we populated, uh, that we specified when we created our uh, eBPF program. You can see the name of the command that is uh, allocating too much memory. It's called stress. You can see the process ID. You can see how much memory it wanted to uh, allocate. So it's basically up to you what kind of information you are extracting from the, from the kernel. All right, that was it. Uh, I think we still have one more slide on possible uh, improvements on, on Bumblebee itself. Um, you can use Bumblebee, as we mentioned, to get familiar with DBPF. You only need to focus on the actual um, kernel space um, prob uh, problems that you want to solve. What you could see that was missing is um, really tight uh, Kubernetes integration. So you could only see, for example, the names, the, the process names, but not the names of the pod that were getting uh, out of memory. Uh, that was that was getting um killed. Uh, we are also collaborating with Inspector Gadget uh, from the Kinfolk forms. They are now working uh, with uh, with Microsoft, and they are also, they are using our OCI loading uh, layer so that you can uh, deploy. Uh, a custom um, eBPF uh, logic with the Inspector Gadget tooling using an o OCI packaging layer, which is which is quite nice. If you want to uh, uh, contribute to Bumblebee or BCC, you can take a look at uh, academy.solo.io. We have uh, multiple eBPF la uh, labs there. There's the beginner one that was mostly presented here, but there's also an advanced one. The umkill example is coming from there, but there, there you can have more details on the actual migration passes and some advanced scenarios like putting multiple uh, eBPF programs together. Uh, if you're interested in that, it's, uh, it's quite nice. Thank you for attending this, uh, this workshop, and uh, please reach out if you have any uh, questions after the talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I, I think we have a question for, we have time for one question. Uh, if you want to speak more about it, you know, you can came, come to our booth and we will be there for the next hour, but yeah. Yeah, uh, so um, I was just wondering if you could elaborate more about the contents of the image you're creating and uh, if, uh, if you also have some experience with um, images being on public um, uh, registries and, and how, how you handle these or are these even supported? Thanks. Yeah, so I mean the, the content this, of this OCI image is mainly the binary basically, the, the same one that you would just like uh, create with, uh, you know, without it. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't think if, do you have like more information about like what it would contain exactly if you would. We also, we also include the headers, so you also don't need to, to ship those to another machine when you, where you actually deploy the, the pod. Um, you can also use, when we originally created Bumblebee, there wasn't that many public repositories that supported this particular OCI format, but now if you try to push these images to uh, to the Docker Hub or, or a GitHub uh, registry, that, that should work out of the box because they have support. Otherwise, you can just self-host your own repository or use the one that is used by your company, and uh, it should just work. The, okay. the, the support for the OCI repositories is, is quite nice now. Yeah. Also, thanks for the workshop, by the way. Thanks for attending. <laughs> thanks, everyone, and uh, wish you, like, uh, Good end of uh, KubeCon with uh, low energy probably, but uh, we're almost there. Thanks everyone. Safe travels.